All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Secretary Vonk. Today, John and I are going to review what we do as a department for monitoring our elk populations. We're going to cover some of our research data. We're going to get in into a elk habitat and what we have available in the Black Hills. We're going to talk um, some about that today. And then we're going to end up with our 2013 harvest statistics and what our recommendations are for proposal. With that said, I'm going to start off with a little bit of South Dakota elk history. It's always fun to kind of look back real quick to see where we come from. Of course, elk are native and considered numerous um, pre-European settlement. And then uh, with European settlement and unregulated harvest and market hunting, um, like a lot of our big game species, they were pretty much wiped out and they were considered extirpated by uh, 1888 in the Black Hills. In the early 1900s, we began transplanting elk across the Black Hills to, to bring back the populations from numerous areas across the West. And in 1952, we had our actual first limited license season. And we pretty much maintained low elk population numbers from the 50s through the 80s. And then in the 80s and the 90s, and this wasn't that long ago, we actually were um, kind of took another effort to um, transplant more elk from Wind Cave National Park uh, across the hills um, to try and boost that elk population to what we have today. And um, they did increase to the 90s to our all-time highs that we saw here in the early to mid-2000s. This graph kind of demonstrates uh, a little bit of the history on the elk there. You can see in the, in the uh, early 80s there, to all the way to early 90s, this is our harvest data. Um, bulls and the gray bars and antlerless elk or cow elk in the in the red but you can see in the 80s and 90s you know we, we were harvesting very few elk and that was representative of our population in the 80s and 90s again we were transplanting elk around and they started growing until the 90s and then all the way in the 2000s you can see we really peaked in our elk population and subsequently our harvest mid 2000s we realized we wanted to get on top of the population and and bring it down a bit and that's represented by the red bars there you can see in in uh, 2005 i believe we we topped out at, at close to 900 cow elk harvested so we were really getting on that population and we slowly began to back off from there ever since 2005 all the way to um, this last year 2013 we've been backing off on cow harvest to try and bring that population back you can see, I want to point out, we've been backing off on, on bull harvest here, the, the gray lines. Until about four years ago, um, we wanted to maintain some, some level of a bull hunting opportunity in the Black Hills. So we tapered off there, and we've been pretty consistent around 300 bulls harvested in the hills here the last four years. And that'll play a part in, in what we make for a recommendation this year. Another important uh, data set we look at is our... Um, the age of our harvested animals and I'm just going to go over the bull harvest data here so focus on the big graph here first um, this is just looking at uh, th those incisors because we require it's a mandatory check for our elk um, we, we require those uh, uh, those middle two incisors and we age every animal that's harvested based on incisor wear and replacement so looking at the bulls this last year you can see about 40 percent of them we're in that four plus year old bulls. And those are your, typically your six point uh, mature bulls um, are, are gonna be about four, four years old and they'll get bigger obviously as, as they go on. So that's basically what we consider a trophy animal here. If folks are able to harvest a six point bull, that, that's a trophy opportunity for, um, for hunters in South Dakota. So last year, 40% of the bulls harvested were, were in that trophy type of category. And then you can see the breakout there, um, you know, a little over half of them were those younger age bulls and then you can see some some yearlings and even a few calves there um, so last year were 40 percent nothing wrong with that that that's that's all right um, but one of the things we look at is what the trend is over time and you can see in 2011 um, well let's look at 2012 first the previous year we're at 53 percent so we had a little bit more um, um, mature animals in the harvest and then in the previous year we were at 65 and that was one of the highest we've recorded um, we did change methods a little bit, so maybe that's a, that anomaly is because of a little bit of change in methods. But regardless, we do see a little bit of a downward trend. Now, whether this is significant or not, I don't know. And maybe 40% is acceptable. 
This is something we're going to have to address in our, in our management plan. What's that threshold that we want for mature bull harvest? But um, regardless, this is something we're, we want to keep an eye on and, and continue to monitor the mature um, bull harvest that we see. Another survey we do every fall is we do our, our herd composition counts. Um, these are random gram, ground counts we do in August and September. And from these data, we get our age ratios and our sex ratios, which is important for our, our monitoring and population modeling. Um, currently, actually right now, um, we are evaluating uh, whether or not we can obtain these data in the springtime as well. Um, you know, when we do it in, in August and September, that gives us a good estimate of fall recruitment, but we'd, we'd like an estimate of annual recruitment. And so we, knew we, we know we lose some animals over the winter time. If we could do it this time of year, it would be closer estimate of recruitment. So we are attempting to do that. We've done it in the past. Um, conditions are a little more problematic with the uh, snow, snow depths out there and road access and trying to get around to count animals. Um, so it, it's gonna, it might have some difficulties, but we're going to give it a shot, see what kind of samples we can get, and see um, how comparable the data are and whether or not this is a, a good technique to, to use. Um, this was something that was brought up in the WMI review, and it was a suggestion that we consider this. And, and like I mentioned, we've looked at it before, but we're going we're gonna to give it a go and see what we can do here. But for now, looking at our, our fall, um, fall recruitment, this is what we've seen over the years. This is looking at our age ratios. So this is our, our calves per 100 cows. Um, you can see the, the general trend there. You know, we've, we've been bouncing around that. 50 calves per 100 cows. This last year we were at 46. Um, there are some areas in the hills where we have less recruitment than that, and there's some areas in the hills where we have better recruitment than that, but by and large we've been seeing it average around that 50 calves per 100 cows, um, which is good recruitment and, and definitely ample recruitment for, for our population. Another thing we look at is, is sex ratios, and, and this is a, a graph of our bulls per 100 cows. And, and looking at the, the red line, which is the actual um, variable we're looking at, the bulls per 100 cows. Um, you can see since uh, uh, we started gathering good data, and I should have covered this in the last one, these green bars are our sample sizes. So you can see since we started gathering good data in 2009, um, we've been bouncing around that uh, you know low 20s to, to mid 30s range. This last year we were at 20 bulls per 100 cows, which is, which is uh, plenty sufficient for um, for uh, our recruitment and, and breeding purposes of our population. Another important survey we do is our aerial surveys. Um, we did this in, in 2013. Um, before I get into the results of the survey, first I want to talk a little bit about um, the citability models we, we use for this survey. Now we use a model because it allows us to estimate uh, how many animals we actually miss. Um, when, we, when we do a survey, whether it's for deer or elk or pronghorn, we know there's a percentage of the population that we're not going to observe. And the citability model allows us to estimate what that percentage of the population is. And um, we, we've, uh, we have a model that's specific to South Dakota. We developed it um, um, through uh, SDSU and some of our data collection. Overall, we're seeing about 60% of the elk, so that means we're missing about 40% of them. And um, the best model that we have to predict the animals we miss is a model that includes uh, the group size and vegetative cover and snow cover. So those are variables that we collect in addition to elk numbers when we count our survey. Um, like I mentioned, we flew in 2013. We did not fly this last year in 2014. Um, we plan to um, do kind of a rotational schedule maybe every three years or so. Um, we need to better define what that time period is going to be, but right now we're, we're looking at maybe every three years or so. So looking at some of the results here, um, this is a map of, of the winter counts. Um, you can see either every place there's a number that's a subunit. And there's a lot of subunits you can see all across the hills. We flew 100% of those and this is unique in that most of our surveys will fly X percentage of the survey and extrapolate to the rest of the population to see what it is. Um, but this was a really great opportunity. We flew 100%, so there's no extrapolation to the rest of the area. We flew everything. And so it gives us a unique opportunity to look at what we had for elk in 2013. This map shows the actual count data. There's no model correction here. And it gives you an idea of what the distribution of the elk, um, elk population is during the wintertime. So it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, oops, about um, 
you know, 75% of our population is down there in the Jasper Fire Burn area. They're really, really homing in on that, and that's an important resource for our elk population. Now, a few more uh, more things on aerial surveys here. I want to get, get to some actual data. We counted about 4,600 animals. That's no model correction, so we actually counted a little over 4,600 elk in 2013. Our estimate with the model was about 5,100 animals out there. So um, that's the estimate of our, our Black Hills unit population. That excludes the park, so it uh, doesn't count CSP and Wind Cave. That was, that was all of our units combined would be about 5,100. And that's an important number. Um, for Wind Cave and Custer State Park, they were about 500. I did a little rounding, but all, overall there's about 1,000 animals in the park last, in the two parks combined last year for an overall population of about 6,100. Now we share elk with Wyoming, um, part of the Black Hills Forest Service uh, properties in Wyoming as well as other um, private lands. And ideally we would have been able to do this survey with Wyoming and they would have surveyed their, their site at the same time. Um, but it didn't work out that way. They didn't have time or, or money or staff to, to get it done when we did. And unfortunately we, we don't have the complete picture knowing what Wyoming had. But we did, we did jump over there for a couple hours. We knew of a few areas where they had some elk and they told us a few areas, but um, we just didn't have time and money for, to spend our money on, on, on surveying 100% of Wyoming's elk too. So, um, but we did count a couple hundred animals over there and we know there's some groups that we couldn't get to. I do want to emphasize this 5100. When I get into talking about forage, this is really important. Um, I'm not going to be talking about the 6100 because when we talk about forage calculations, we're looking at forage on the Forest Service land in our hunting units and CSP and Wind Cave is, is a different different calculation and different number we'll work with. So that 5100 uh, Black Hills unit estimate is important. Now I just want to quickly summarize um, some of the um, Research projects we have going on, we're, we're wrapping up a couple projects, uh, uh, a three-year project in Custer State Park and a two-year project in, in, in Unit 2. Um, both great projects, had a great opportunity to look at, to see what cow survival is, calf survival, cow specific mortality. We're going to have some great information. Um, Unit 2, or CSP right now, they're monitoring uh, 37 cows, 3 yearlings, and 21 calves. In Unit 2, um, we're only monitoring 21 calves there. Um, the study is concluding. The grad student um, is, going, is back in school now. So um, he timed those collars to drop off those animals. So now he's looking at all the data that's on those store and board collars. Um, so he's going through the process of data analysis right now. So everything I talk about is pretty preliminary, but we did ask him for some numbers. So we'll just kind of give everybody a little heads up on where we're at. And same with CSP. Um, pregnancy rates for CSP. Uh, we saw 90% in 2013, it was 95% uh, in 2012. Um, for Unit 2, it was uh, low this year, 66%, and hopefully that's not a trend. The year before, it was 93%. Um, for cow survival, in 2013 at CSP, it was 93% and 83% the year before. In Unit 2, the average over the two years was 85%, so pretty decent cow survival. And then calf survival, um, the first year um, um, CSP saw some really low calf survival. The next year it jumped up a little bit to 27%. Of course, we're not through that full year to report what annual calf survival was for those calves born in May of 2013 or so. Um, so we don't have annual survival rates, but up to March, uh, Chad Lehman calculated a calf survival rate of, of 31%. You can see the um, causes of mortality. Um, Chad had a really good sample size of 58 calves, but... Um, Lost a fair number of them to lions, 27 lion predations, uh, three coyotes and one bobcat, a couple miscellaneous, and then uh, four collars were uh, either slipped off or caught on fences and came off. Um, for, for Unit 2, calf survival was much better in 2012, 66%. Um, those animals uh, had a much better survival rate, and again, this year we don't have annual survival, but so far, um, looking at six-month survival between the two years, um, ben Simpson calculated a 76% survival rate. That's the grad student that's working on that project. And, and here's the sources of mortality that he reported. Um, only five lions. Um, he had a little smaller captured number there, 33 this year. Five lion predations, one unknown, a couple miscellaneous, and then again four that were slipped off um, due to fences. So that's a pretty quick rundown on our, our elk research. Um, next thing I want to talk about is our, our population growth and whether or not the population's growing. Of course, we took, 
we take this elk research data, we take all the survival rates of adults and calves, we look at our recruitment, we look at, we look at our other survey data, our winter estimate, uh, what we have for harvest rates, and we try and pro project what the population's doing. And, and all the models that we run, they all say we have a growing population. I think that's the take home message here. Um, we have a lambda greater than one. Lambda of one means the population's stable. If it's greater than one, it means it's growing. If it's less than one, it's just decreasing. So um, everything we look at, we have a, a growing population of elk and that's gonna play into our season recommendations. Now I wanna jump gears a little bit and kind of dive into elk habitat and and uh, you know the bulk of our elk are on, in the Black Hills and they're on um, U.S. Forest Service property so I think it's important to step back and look and see what we have um, have for available habitat habitat out there as, as we uh, go into the future and try to manage for X number of elk in, in the hills. Um, to do that we really lean on the you know United States Forest Service they have a Forest Service plan and, and they've uh, They've estimated total forage out there. In their forest plan, they estimated 466 million pounds of forage to start here. And that's considering South Dakota and Wyoming. And the Forest Service manages for 50% utilization of the forage. Um, so they're, they're saying that 233 million pounds of forage is available. Um, and then the Forest Service allocates that forage to livestock versus wildlife. Um, they allocate 127 million pounds towards livestock and 106 million pounds towards wildlife. So we need to look at that 106 million pounds um, um, for the purposes of this discussion and what we have available. They also on their Forest Service plan estimate um, forage uh, um, capabilities outside of the Forest Service property. Um, they look at the private lands out there and I'm not gonna dive into this and, and their methods, but on the bottom line is they estimate even after private land grazing and hay, and there's, there's, and there's about 180 million other pounds of forage available too. So there's quite a bit of forage out there. This is a table of, of potential forage in AUMs, those are animal unit months, um, that the Forest Service has in their Forest Service plan. And I wanna talk about this. Um, they, they have the 23,000 um, head of livestock and, and, and these, uh, number of, of deer and elk 70,000 and 4,500 elk um, and those were combined uh, um, numbers between Wyoming and South Dakota when they when they wrote the plan and these are potential AUMs so they calculated AUMs based on those numbers and they came up with a million pounds of forage use and this is basically what this, they're saying the Forest Service property could hold um, potentially when they did their plan back in 1996. So we have this 106 million pounds um, which equates to about that many deer and elk if you use that many deer and elk. Um, but one thing that we, we want to point out is that this includes both South Dakota and Wyoming. So 86% of the Black Hills Forest Service properties in South Dakota. So we're just going to look at South Dakota's side since we're managing the South Dakota elk and that's what we're going to concentrate on. And so just looking at the South Dakota side, that means 91 million pounds are available. So we don't have the 106 million, we have 91 million pounds. So that's an important number I'll, I'll come back to here in a minute. Next thing I want to look at is actual utilization. Um, in the Forest Service plan, they, they estimate that wildlife um, use Forest Service property 85% of the time and private property 15% of the time. Um, that's a pretty important number. Um, obviously, we, we can't uh, move wildlife from allotment to allotment, they're gonna go where they, uh, where they wanna go and we know they, they go on private property as well and we need to acknowledge that. Um, we, we looked at some of our data to see if um, we thought this 8515 was, was an appropriate number, if it was uh, um, similar to what we see in, in some of our data. So we did some preliminary estimates looking at uh, 2013 aerial survey. You know, we have GPS locations for, for every elk we count. So we went and then overlaid our GPS locations to land ownership maps. And we come out about, in the wintertime, about 80% of our elk were on Forest Service property and 20% on private, so that was pretty close there. Um, that, that's winter distribution. And then we looked at some of our research data in the northern hills and the eastern part of the hills um, that incorporates some more annual data, and we were at about 70, 30, so it was a, it was a little bit different, but, but still um, probably in that ballpark. So the 85, 15 is conservative, and that's what we're going to go with when we talk about um, utilization. And, Bottom line is, is the Forest Service does acknowledge there is more wildlife forage out there because they don't spend 100% of their time on Forest Service property. So looking at actual 
South Dakota Wildlife and Forest Service forage. Again, there's that 91 million pounds available in South Dakota. They're on the property 85% of the time. So basically what we did here is, is re-ran some of the Forest Service numbers. And um, we didn't do this by ourselves. We also talked with the Forest Service and met with them. And um, they did some of their calculations too. And we all agreed that this was an appropriate way to, to use these data and to evaluate the forage use for wildlife. Um, but so here we're, we're just taking, these are just South Dakota numbers. Let's say we had 60,000 deer and 4,000 elk. These are based on the Forest Service plan. And, and we re recalculated the AUMs and the total forage use. And what's different here is we calculated the actual use on Forest Service property because that's what the Forest Service plan focuses on. And that comes out to be about 79 million pounds, which gives us almost 12 million pounds additional than what the Forest Service plan has in there as far as um, numbers of wildlife. So 12 million more pounds, you could easily add 2,500 elk to that 4,000 elk that's in the Forest Service plan. So the bottom line is there is more forage out there when you look at the reality of public versus private uh, use of, by the wildlife. And, you know, one thing we need to consider is, is you know, in a year we're going to be looking at deer management plan. We need to consider deer numbers too and we can do, go through this exercise. But uh, um, 60,000 deer is a lot of deer to consider there. So, so what's our goal going to be? Um, well, obviously we're going to uh, do a lot of things that, to get public input. Uh, Cindy Longmire did a great uh, public uh, opinion survey. Um, we're going to have public meetings uh, we have a draft plan to talk about. Um, um, Tom's mentioned our stakeholder group meetings and, and, and that's gonna be a process too. We get input and then of course the commission process. And then of course private land uh, depredation complaints, landowner tolerances, that's part of public input but that deserves its own separate bullet I think that, that weighs heavily on, on how we manage our populations. Forage availability which I just talked about and then previous elk populations is also something we're, we're gonna look at and we have been looking at. So here's kind of a, a back calculation of elk population, if you will. Um, th this is our one good solid data point. I'll just point that out. 2013, that's the first time and the only time we've ever surveyed the entire Black Hills. We feel pretty good about that estimate. We had about 5,100 elk in the winter of, in, in 2013. We took our survival data. We took our, um, all the research data we could find, looked at our recruitment. We looked at uh, some of our other population data and did the best job we could to back calculate what the elk populations were. And, and we feel pretty comfortable um, that this follows the general trend of the population. Um, the bottom line is, you know, we probably peaked out when we, when we had our highest elk population in 2005, and that's when we had our highest harvest. We peaked out at about 7,000 animals. And again, this excludes the parks. There's another 1,000 plus animals in the parks then. Um, but this is just talking about our Black Hills hunting units. So we were at about 7,000. So that's about where our population high has been in recent history. And then, um, you know, maybe a low to look at is in 2013 when we were at 5,100. That's the same time that uh, Cindy did the public opinion survey. And um, the majority of uh, responses in the public opinion survey, whether it be landowner or hunter, um, was that um, they wanted more elk. So maybe that maybe that's a good low point to look at. And if that's the case, um, trying to look at a future objective. We, we threw out to the, to the um, stakeholder group that um, you know, I'm pretty simple minded, let's pick a number right in between and maybe that's a place to start for discussion. And that's 6,000 elk. And, and if you put uh, plus or minus 10% on either side, because we're never perfect enough to manage for 6,000 elk, um, you know, it puts us anywhere from uh, 5,400 to 6,600 elk. And, and, and so that's kind of where we've been going with the discussion. Um, is 6,000 the right number to manage for? Of course, some people want more and, and some people want less. Um, and th those are things we need to evaluate as well. Um, one, one of the questions we've been kind of working on since the stakeholder group meeting, of course, we're in the middle of our elk planning process. And we're, we're developing a plan, so we're crunching a lot of numbers, trying to figure a lot of things out here in short order. But one of the things that we're looking at is, is, is can we even hold more out there as far as the habitat goes? Is that even an option? And, and one of the things that um, some staff put together is, is actual some of our drought data. You know, we always know, we, we don't know, but we always say we, you know, we had about a decade of drought in the early 2000s, you know, starting in the late 1900s probably. And we had about a decade of drought and that really affected landowner tolerance, that really affected forage availability. And consequently, that's also when we had some of our highest elk populations. So, you know, landowner tolerance was definitely low there. 
Had we not had the drought, um, would have been higher. I don't know, but it's something I think that's worthy of discussion. This is a, um, just a, a graph showing the um, uh, inches of precipitation that, that vary from, from the normal, the normal being this line right here. So you can see all those early 2000 years were, were below normal precips, and that's um, very well demonstrated by the actual precipitation. And these colors are the precipitation values in each of our, our management units in the Black Hills. So it's specific to the hills. So um, we definitely had some drought, drought issues going on there when we had high, high elk populations. And the next thing I want to talk about was, um, is, is has, there, has there been any forage increases since the Forest Service plan? You know, they, they evaluated forage in, in the 90s, um, actually, in their plan. And it hasn't been evaluated since. And, and we've had some substantial events. Um, Jasper Fire is definitely one of them. You know, that's a 83,000 plus acre area that opened up a lot of canopy cover and um, without a doubt has increased forage production. And you can see how significant, you know, 83,000 acres is to the Black Hills. That's, that's a big chunk of the hills. And then you add in um, mountain pine beetles. Um, I know not everybody likes them, but the elk probably do because that's opening up a lot of canopy cover. Um, you know, the estimate, the latest estimate is over 380,000 acres. That's, you know, four and a half more of those Jasper fire size areas that are get, getting opened up. And that doesn't mean every acre is going to be better for, for elk. Don't get me wrong, but without a doubt, when you open up that canopy, by and large, you're going to have more forage. So, um, you know, there's definitely a possibility we have a lot more forage out there. And, you know, that's something the Forest Service will have to measure and evaluate the next time they go through their planning process. And we're not going to have that before we finish our plan. So something we need to be aware of and as we move forward and try to try to define what a future population objective should be. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. He's going to talk about some of our harvest data and, and our recommendations. Thanks, Andy. I'll take a quick second and introduce myself to the new commissioners. I'm John Kent. I'm the Regional Wildlife Manager uh, stationed out in Rapid City. I know Tom introduced Andy, so I didn't want you to think I was just some scary guy following him up here, so I'm pretty ugly looking sometimes. Uh, what I have here, Andy talked to you about the population objective that we've kind of been throwing out to the public, and we're going to continue to work on that and try and evaluate and, and set that objective over the next several months. Uh, but what I have here is a map of kind of where we sit right now prior to that input and, and setting that objective. And as you can see uh, by the color codes here, so the, the dark blue means substantially in, uh, increase that population, and of course the dark red or maroon is substantially decreased. And we've got uh, those uh, placed on the, the units here in the Black Hills. And you can see, by and large, we're looking to increase the elk population in the Black Hills. Overall, that's what we're talking about. I'd point out just a couple of specifics to you. Uh, so unit two here, so that's where the Jasper fire is and where we counted the bulk of the elk. Um, you can see that we have slightly increased. So we've got a lot of elk there right now. We do want to increase slightly, but... Uh, 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 you know, that's how it factors in overall. Another quick uh, point I'd make is uh, take you over to these units here east of Custer State Park and Wind Cave National Park. These are predominantly private land units. And uh, you can see there that we have substantially increased the population. I kind of want to put that into perspective for you and, and um, uh, help you to understand that even though it says substantially increase, uh, really with the low densities of elk there and, and, and in relation to that private property and some of the depredation issues we have, even though it says substantial, we're probably talking in some of those areas, you know, uh, increase of only 20 to 30 elk in some cases. So you have to kind of put that all into perspective. Uh, lastly, I'd just point out that we do have some units outside of the Black Hills. We call them prairie units. I'm going to go over those a little bit more in depth in a minute, um, but just notice that we do have uh, population objectives on, on those as well. And by and far, we're looking to maintain or slightly decrease. Now, there's some issues in those units. Uh, they're predominantly private land. We have some depredation issues, and uh, I'll talk more about those as well here in a minute. So next, I want to just take a closer look at uh, some of the uh, harvest uh, information that we collect. Andy kind of gave you a curse review, but uh, I'll run over just some high points here. So as you can see, this is Black Hills rifle elk, or the firearm elk season from 2000 to 2013. I'm not going to go through all of this data uh, with you, but I will just point out a couple of things. You can look back and see that... Uh, uh, you know, we've had a high of over 14,500 applicants there in the mid-2000s uh, to a low of uh, uh, just over 9,600 here in 2012. Um, uh, so you can see that we, we've got a lot of interest, of course, in our, our elk licenses there in the Black Hills. 
Um, Andy alluded to this earlier, but I just point out again, uh, our bull harvest has remained pretty steady throughout the years. We have seen a slight reduction these last few years, um, but relatively speaking, that bull harvest opportunity has stayed pretty stable over, over the last 10 years or so. Um, the other thing to point out here is, again, that, that pretty significant increase to the cow harvest, a, a high of almost 900 in 2005. And, of course, that does correlate with that increase in the population, that drought. We work to try and drive that population down. So a pretty uh, significant increase to that antlerless harvest there. Last, I would just point out our success rates here. You could see that uh, overall we've stayed over 50% success uh, uh, over the last 10 years or so. And we're pretty excited about that. We like to see that success way up there. A lot of our folks that are getting their elk uh, tags are applying for them. Uh, they're waiting a long time. And so the expectation is a, a good hunt uh, for elk out there. And 50% plus success is really good when you compare that uh, to a lot of the Western states. Quickly look at a graph uh, back to 1966 showing some of that same data. Um, you can see the uh, open circles here. This line here is success. Uh, the, the squares is licenses issued and then the dark circles is elk harvested. And again, I would just point out that that dramatic increase to the uh, licenses issued and, and the elk harvested uh, there with that increase in the population and through that drought. Um, and of course, you could see that we've, we've dropped down here. Uh, one thing to notice again, uh, you know, going back about 20 years, we've maintained between 50 and 75 percent success on this elk population. Uh, with our hunters. So pr pretty interesting stuff. Uh, uh, last thing I would point out or I like to point out is even though we're, we're, we're kind of at a low right now and we're hearing, uh, 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 you know, that we'd like to see more elk, um, it is interesting to see that uh, when you look at licenses issued and, and number of elk harvested, looking back to 1966, we're still at a, a pretty good point and a higher point that we've been prior to, to uh, 2000 or the 2000s. So um, next, I, I want to jump into recommendations for rifle elk and just go over those real quick with you. Of course, we use all the information that Andy went over, our survey data, our research data. We put all that together and, and uh, that along with public opinion. We hold some landowner meetings and we meet with some of our public and, of course, our survey work that we do to get public opinion and incorporate that all uh, to formulate the recommendations that we're bringing to you. Quickly, uh, for the new commissioners and, and, and just a refresher, I want to go over the units. These are our Black Hills rifle units. Um, so just quickly, I'll show you a, a unit one in the north here. That's predominantly public land. We do have some private land in that unit. Uh, unit two is often referred to as our premier unit or it's an area that uh, most folks want to go hunting. We have high densities of elk. It's predominantly public land, uh, easy access. You don't have to ask for permission. Um, so that's really where a lot of folks want to go. Uh, the north half of unit three, uh, here is is quite a little bit of public land lots of access opportunities and then the south half is uh, uh, pr predominantly private land uh, that's one of the reasons you see these lines so this is all unit three but we have split it in half uh, for the antlerless licenses just because of that public versus private land situation uh, same thing with unit two uh, quickly here uh, these eastern units as I mentioned just a moment ago those are uh, almost uh, exclusively private land private land pardon me and so we do uh, deal with some depredation issues and treat uh, our, our elk populations or manage them a little bit differently there on that eastern front. Um, unit 5 is what we consider our uh, uh, wilderness unit, for lack of better words. Uh, the reason we call it that is because there's very little access. Uh, one can't uh, find a lot of uh, access points with motorized vehicles. And so you, you, if you're going to hunt that unit, you plan on walking in and, and spending a lot of time uh, hoofing it on foot. And if you get an elk down, likely you're going to have to take it out in pieces. And then lastly, we have Unit 7, which is uh, a, a mixture of public and private land. So uh, quickly, uh, just going over our recommendations, you can, you can see that uh, we've, we've asked for an increase to our any elk licenses, or excuse me, our antlerless elk licenses overall, and a slight decrease to uh, the any elk licenses. Um, predominantly that increase, or, or that increase is in unit two. So we're asking for an additional 200 antlerless licenses there in unit two. And I'll, I'll kind of go over at the end here how that all uh, works out and what that does for the population here so you have a good understanding of that. Um, the other recommendation that we're making is to modify the, the uh, unit boundary of unit seven here. 
and I'm going to jump to the next slide. All of these maps, by the way, and this information is in your uh, booklets that you received. Um, so Unit 7 uh, is depicted here, and currently as it stands, we have this little chunk that sticks out here east of uh, Interstate 90. We put that in place a couple of years ago because we did have some private land out there uh, where we had elk uh, cross over the interstate and, and basically take up residence there, and they were causing those private landowners some damage. Um, prior to uh, 2012, we were holding some pool hunts and uh, 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 working with those landowners outside of the season. So we did include it in the season to try and get some additional harvest. Um, we're asking you to take it out now, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a few minutes uh, about where I want to go with that. We do still want to offer harvest opportunity there, uh, but we want to put it into the prairie uh, unit, and so I'll explain that in just a minute. But this is what your new Unit 7 would look like. It would just take that, uh, that, that area out. I'll jump to archery harvest next. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this graph either. Just simply point out that we typically between three and 4,000 applicants. And again, I, I just like to point out the success rate. You know, we're hanging right around that 30% uh, percent success rate, which again is really good if you, if you look and compare to some of the other western states that offer archery hunting on elk. And so our archery hunting recommendation, uh, units are uh, uh, relatively the same. You just don't see the splits for antlerless like you do in uh, rifle. Um, we are asking for additional uh, antlerless elk licenses uh, in uh, the archery season. Um, and again, those additional licenses would be in unit two. And this is proportionate to the increases that we're making in the, in the rifle season. Uh, one of the things that we want to do as we work through the next year and write the management plan is come up with a system uh, to define exactly how we make increases to the archery season in relation to the rifle season. So that's something that you'll see uh, over the next year that we'll, we'll define that and put that in the plan and come back uh, next year uh, with a, a specific uh, strategy to define that. Um, and then, of course, we want to modify the Unit 7 boundaries here to, uh, to reflect those changes that we did in the rifle season. Uh, quickly going over the prairie units again, I just want you to have a good idea of what we're dealing with here. So I'll start up here in the uh, northwest. This is actually in Butte County near the Redwater River. Uh, we have, this is all private land. Uh, we're dealing with elk that come in and out of uh, Wyoming here, and then also a small resident herd that exists there. So we have a, sig a significant amount of damage, uh, in particular to irrigated alfalfa down along the Redwater River. Um, these, these landowners there are really a, pre uh, excuse me, a pleasure to work with um, and, and help them with that damage, of course, uh, but also allow some opportunity for our hunters to come up there and, and harvest some elk. Uh, Unit 9, similar situation. We have elk coming across the interstate at about exit 17, uh, causing some dam damage there uh, to private property. So we did initiate a, uh, a season there as well. Um, take you down to Fall River County here. Uh, again, same situation, elk coming across the Cheyenne River and residing on private land south of the Cheyenne River. And so we initiated that season to help address some of that depredation. And then lastly, uh, we have uh, Bennett County here and, and a little chunk in Millette County. We're dealing with elk, uh, particularly on the Pine Ridge Reservation and the Rosebud Reservation, that again come over and cause damage to uh, these private properties and, and uh, private uh, or, uh, 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 crops that occur there. And so we do have a season to help address some of those issues. Um, I should mention, too, over in Region 2 here, uh, we do have a prairie unit there as well, um, and that's a, a shared season with, uh, with Nebraska. But not anymore. Thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, we changed that last year, so we, we don't uh, uh, re uh, reciprocate there. Uh, quickly looking at prairie elk harvest, I won't go into a lot of detail here either. Uh, what you'll see here is that it's kind of all over the place. So uh, those elk some years are not there or we're not seeing as much damage. So we work closely with those landowners to try and uh, tailor those licenses to the needs of the landowners, uh, the number of hunters that they'll need to address some of their depredation issues. But again, you know, uh, we're sticking in that 30 to 50 percent success. So uh, some pretty good opportunity there. And this, of course, is separate from that Black Hills archery opportunity and separate from the Black Hills rifle. So it's an additional opportunity for our sports and some pretty good success. So jumping right into our prairie elk uh, recommendations here. Um, so we're looking at overall an increase to the any elk licenses and a slight decrease to the antlerless licenses. 
Um, all of the particulars, again, are in your book, and I can answer any questions here at the end. Um, we're also asking for a change to the season dates in Unit 9. And again, that's at the request of our landowners. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about an area that we want to include into Unit 9 here in a minute. And we're, we're experiencing depredation late into December, so we'd like to extend those season dates to help uh, get hunters in and address some of those depredation issues. Um, and lastly, I want to modify, uh, we'd ask you to modify the Unit 9, uh, per Unit 9 boundary, and I've got maps here to depict that as well. So let me start with uh, the addition down here. Um, so this is, pardon me, this is that area that we uh, took out of Unit 7. And again, the biggest reason behind that is we want a little bit more flexibility with season dates and a little bit more flexibility with hunters to uh, specifically target some of those depredation issues that we're having there. In addition to that, we have uh, been talking to some of the other landowners south of that unit that are experiencing some damage too, so they've asked to be included in that unit. Um, the other change that we'd like to make is, is add this addition to the east, northeast, uh, crossed Highway 44 here from the original unit. You can see the original unit here. Um, we have elk uh, uh, crossing Highway 34. There, some of them are hit by cars there, and, and certainly uh, we have some landowners that are complaining over here about the, uh, uh, the elk that are occurring there. So we just want the opportunity to have our hunters go in there and try and help address some of those depredation issues in those areas. Uh, just touch briefly on Custer State Park. Uh, so as you can see here, kind of kind of status quo, so to speak. Uh, we're, we're asking that uh, we keep the CSP antlerless elk season closed. We'd like to keep the late archery elk season closed. And then we are, excuse me, we are recommending a slight change to the early archery elk and the CSP rifle elk. We're asking you to go from uh, or reduce those by one license. And maybe if I could, I'll just jump to the next slide. Uh, one of the reasons that we're asking you to do that is to open up that chapter so that we have that season on the table uh, in the event that we may want to make some changes at finalization. And the reason for that is we, we do plan to push elk out of Wind Cave National Park again this year. You'll remember that we did that last year. Um, our, uh, we anticipate pushing approximately 100 elk. Uh, north out of Wind Cave into Custer State Park. And then of course, uh, we're, we're aiming to push 100 elk out this west side as well uh, into Unit 3. And because of the unknowns here, meaning we don't know how successful we'll be, and then we certainly don't know what the sex uh, makeup will be of those groups that we push in, you know, how many bulls versus cows. And so that definitely impacts what we might want to offer for licenses there in Custer State Park. Um, so we're asking you to open that up so that we can, uh, once we conduct this over the next couple of weeks, we'll make some good counts and take that into consideration and come back with uh, a recommendation if need be to change those licenses. So last, I'd like to just go over uh, kind of what, what this means, what these recommendations mean uh, in regards to our elk population. And so uh, as Andy went over with you earlier, our, our 2003 winter population estimate based on those aerial surveys is approximately 5,100 elk. And you can see we have the confidence intervals here, uh, which ends up being a range of about 4,800 to 6,100 elk. And remember that that excludes the park. So that's not including Custer State Park or Wind Cave National Park. Um, so we've taken all this information that we collect from the research, some of our survey data, and we've built models so that we can understand or project where this population might be going into the future. And you can see that next bullet there. Uh, uh, using that data and projecting that population, our winter 2014 winter population estimate is approximately 5,500 elk. So right now, we project that we're at about 5,500 elk here in the Black Hills, excluding the parks again. <clears throat> so if we didn't go with any of the recommended changes, if we just left things the same, same licenses that we offered last year, we estimate that we'll be at approximately 5,900 elk uh, uh, for the winter of 2015, so about a year from now. Um, and, and that does bring us very close to an objective of 66,000 elk, if that's what we want to go with. Um, so increasing population and gets us close to that objective. Now, if we go with the recommended changes, which you know ultimately means uh, uh, 200 antlerless licenses in Unit 2, where the bulk of our elk reside, um, we'd be looking at a, a 2015 winter estimate of approximately 5,800 elk. So what we're going to do is slow that growth 
and, and start to bring that population, uh, 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 or slow it down to, uh, as it gets to that 6,000 elk. Um, so slow the growth of the population. So that's just kind of a rundown of, of what that will do, what those recommendations will do with the population. And with that, we're going to quit talking and answer any question, questions you folks might have. How did I do? Did I go quick enough? <laughs> That's what we're throwing out there for discussion. And we haven't defined an actual objective. That's what we're doing through the management planning process and working with the stakeholder group and, and, and developing the plan and going through the public meetings. And of course, um, you as commissioners will, will hear about that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I threw that 6,000 out there for, it seemed like a reasonable number to put out there for discussion purposes to get us going. Um, because we know we want more than what we had in 2013 when we did our survey. And um, I'm sure you remember the, the public meeting we had the year before where we, you, you guys had a hundred and something people come in and tell you you didn't have any elk in the hills. So we know we want more than that. Um, and, you know, we drew a line at 7,000. I don't know if that's our top or not, but I picked a number in between to start the discussion. And Mr. Chairman, maybe just to kind of reiterate what, what Andy said, that's something that's on my mind. You know, just a year and a half, maybe two years ago, we had people yelling at us that there were no elk. Now, that's certainly just one side of the issue. There's, there's other sides. Um, but, you know, it causes me to wonder, and I think that's where we have the job, and, and of course you as the commissioners over the next several months to decide, is 6,000 enough elk? You know, maybe we want more elk. Maybe we don't. Um, and, and I think it's important, as Andy showed us, we need to consider back when we were having all those issues, we were in a pretty significant drought, so that certainly impacts our landowner tolerance and, and you know, what people will accept for elk, and particularly those landowners trying to make a living on the, la on the land, pardon me. Um, but just some things to, to, to think about when we, we go to set that objective. Yeah, and you know, and of course, the Forest Service—they're they're the land managers on on all the Forest Service property, and and they're they're going to monitor and 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 manage the livestock use on the forest, and and um, based on their calculations, um, there is enough forage for the number of livestock they have, and and the number of wildlife that uh, that we presented to you here today, and we have discussed that with them, and and they are in agreement that we used some of their numbers and calculations correctly. So we are on the same page there. That's not to say that there isn't sometimes a distribution problem, that animals, whether they're livestock or wildlife, are hitting some areas harder than others. And that's a little harder to control for. And obviously that does happen with, in both situations. But uh, looking at the big picture, 
looking at what, what they've estimated for forage, um, we feel comfortable that there is enough forage in the big picture. Correct. And, and the Forest Service uh, um, threw out the 70,000 as a potential number between Wyoming and South Dakota when they did the planning process. 60,000 of those were, were to be in South Dakota. So that's kind of the numbers that I ran with there. Um, we feel pretty confidently our number is substantially less than that right now. Um, we have a research project that's going to be finished up here in a year or so, um, looking at some ways to estimate Black Hills deer. Um, we, 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 we pressured them hard to get some preliminary numbers. You know, we're probably in that 30 to 40,000. It's, it's really tough to estimate deer in a forest canopy cover, and that's the bottom line. It's always going to be kind of a variable estimate. But the bottom line is, is we're substantially lower than that 60,000 number.